Hello, you're watching The Spark, stories that change our times. My name is Allison Budshalo and I'll be your host for today's show. Today we're talking with a number of guests to find out what it will take to make healthcare a human right. But first, let's watch a clip to find out what's going on in healthcare in the United States now. Over 7 million people have already signed up on healthcare.gov with more than 2 million joining in the last two weeks of March. The Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, was first passed in 2010 and now requires most people to buy health insurance from private, for-profit corporations. Although the ACA provides subsidies for millions of people, about 47 million individuals nationwide are still without health insurance. Of these, 5 million fall within what's called the coverage gap. These are people who make too much money for Medicaid and too little to qualify for subsidies under the ACA. In Pennsylvania, 1.4 million people remain uninsured. Governor Tom Corbett initially opposed federally funded Medicaid expansion. More recently, his administration proposed a controversial plan, Healthy Pennsylvania, which would further fund the privatized system. Critics call the proposal delayed and unlikely to take effect. Although we spend twice as much as any other nation on health care, we still can't afford it. Medical debt is the leading cause of bankruptcy in America, and most of the people affected have health insurance. The U.S. spends an average of $8,000 a year per person, but with 31 cents of every dollar going to administrative costs, including CEO salaries and advertisements. This disparity is moving grassroots and community organizations and states around the country to demand health care become a human right. A people's movement led by the Vermont Worker Center passed a law for universal health care in Vermont in 2010. Since then, other grassroots movements around the country have called for health care to become a human right. What does it mean for health care to be a human right? The answer includes universal access where quality health care is available and affordable to everyone without discrimination. What is the future for health care in this country? That is up to the people. I'm Mihir Patel, and you're watching The Spark. Today we're speaking with Mark Dudzik, Nizhmi Zarenko, and Marty Harrison. Mark Dudzik is a national organizer with the Labor Campaign for Single Payer. Nishmi Zarenko is a leader with Put People First Pennsylvania. And Marty Harrison is a nurse and member of the PA Association of Staff Nurses and Allied Professionals, or PASNAP. Welcome everyone to the show. Great to be here. Tell us about how you personally came to this, this fight for health care. Well, I'm a nurse. You don't have to be a nurse very long for it to become very, very clear that even the patients that come to us that actually make it through the system far enough to get to me aren't getting what they need. There aren't enough of us. Um, we don't have the supplies and the equipment that we need to take care of people. I'm very fortunate that I work in a union hospital, which means that I can be um, an advocate for my patients without worrying what's going to happen to me, if I'm going to be disciplined in some way. I can draw the line with any physician and say, this is what my patient needs um, without that fear. I've been a union rep most of my career, and in, in the 1980s, the uh, healthcare costs really started to explode, and it began to affect uh, the lives of the workers that we represented. You know, people, more and more money had to be allocated to health care, which meant that wages were being restrained and people were paying more and more costs and employers were pulling benefits from people and stuff. And we began to explore what was going on and figured out that the U.S. health care system is almost unique in the industrialized world in terms of the way it treats health care as this this product that you access through your employment relationship with a boss mm -hmm. and it's just such a distorted way to do health care and we actually ran some bus tours up to Canada during the uh, debates in the early 90s about health care reform just to, so people could visit the Canadian uh, health care system and kind of deal with a lot of the myths and lies that uh, the press was telling about single payer in Canada and so it's been a really almost part of the DNA of our my union work that we've been working on healthcare justice issues for a lot of years now. Um, I came to healthcare as someone who, um, like so many people, I think, has um, avoided care, has um, mm -hmm. has delayed care um, because I didn't have access or because I didn't have insurance. 
Um, and as an organizer and as a person who works in the community, um, I feel that you know the, my experience is, is similar to many people's experience and in my family, people that I know, um, and we kind of get used to that status quo. We actually think it's okay if I don't go to see a doctor for years mm -hmm. because I don't know how to navigate the system or I can't pay for it. Right. That's just what it is. That's just what I have to accept. Right. Um, and so um, I came to healthcare because I believe that our rights come from struggle. I don't think that we have any rights that we didn't struggle for. And I think that healthcare is a human right. And if we want to see that right realized, we have to struggle for it. Everybody has a healthcare story. Let's watch a few stories of different people's experiences with our healthcare system. Every human being should have the right to get medical services when they need it. My personal finances have to be incredibly controlled so that I have enough cash in my checking account to pay for a much larger premium month to month. I was shocked when I saw that bill. $18,000. Uh, I'm Audrey Williams, and I uh, volunteer at MMP. I am diabetic, and I also have uh, rheumatoid arthritis. As far as getting the medications for the rheumatoid arthritis, I have run into many problems because of the expense. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is one of those um, conditions that come in cycles. You have flares. When it really bothers me, I can barely open the tap on the sink because of the pain. In fact, uh, for a while, I had to change the doorknobs in my house to levers that I could push. When I started taking the medication, my hands improved tremendously. I could turn the taps on, I could turn the water on, I could hold a glass without it falling out of my hands. You know, it was great. It was really great. And, I, and that's, why, um, that's why I'm scared to be without the medication for so long because I can see where it's going backwards. But the insurance that I have doesn't pay in full for the medications that I need, which leaves me with a bill of $3,000, which I cannot afford to pay. No way, Jose. Unfortunately, that is where I am right at the moment as far as health care is concerned. I am a freelance dancer and choreographer. I moved to Philadelphia in 2008, and right away at that time I started looking for health insurance because I knew that if I got an injury of any kind, it could put me out of work. So I first signed up for Adult Basic. It was a program that was actually pretty, seemed pretty good and it was going to be quite affordable. I, I don't remember, like $30 a month or something like that. And um, I was put on the waiting list and told that it would be up to a year and a half or two years. But then Corbett canceled Adult Basic and um, everybody who was had it or was on the waiting list was you know, not going to be able to receive that care. I did some math and I figured out that the individual plan that I qualified for because I was young and healthy and male and a not smoker, uh, my individual plan was $120 a month, something like that. And even, it had a $5,000 deductible. So I signed up for the individual plan and then immediately I did have some emergencies. I, I, was, I was in a bike accident, I um, had some injuries in a performance that I had to deal with. Um, I, bro I tore one of the muscles in my leg. And so it was very good that I had insurance, but I realized that having a high deductible was not the best plan. <laughs> that, um, I ended up spending a lot of my own money um, after, you know, on top of the premiums I was already paying. I, I'm the only one insured in this house because my kids don't have insurance. Um, my husband is out of work. He has been out of work for two and a half years, and he just applied for the Obamacare, and they just gave him $300 in subsidy, and his insurance would be $700. So he has to pay from his own pocket the rest of the money, and he's not where. I mean, from where? I'm the only one, you know, working right now. 
Every time he had to go to the doctor, and he's not working. Every time he had to go to the worker, he had to pay $50 and 50% of the medication. 50% of a high, a high blood pressure medication is at least $100. And, and it's, it's impossible with, you know, all the bills and all the living expenses and to be able to survive. Yeah. And like him, imagine how many more in the same situation. There is too much emphasis on the prophet side and not enough emphasis on the people side. Just because a person doesn't have money doesn't mean that they should not be able to have quality health care. Welcome back to The Spark, stories that change our times. We've been speaking with Mark Dudzik, Nijmi Zarenko, Marty Harrison, about what it will take to make healthcare a human right. So what's your vision for how healthcare could be and what it could look like? Healthcare is a public good. It could, you know, it should work the way we apply public policy. I mean, you know, if your house is on fire, you don't need a card. You don't need to shop around for the best fire department. Somebody comes and helps you. That's what, uh, that, that's my vision. Everybody is in a system. It's, it's uh, organized for the public good and uh, it's treated as a fundamental social right. And we've seen this work in so many other places mm -hmm. in the world. This is not rocket science. You don't need to, you know, rejigger human nature or anything. It's just, you know, it works and it's simple. And from our side of the bed rail, um, uh, we want to be able to do the best job we can for each and every patient. And that means having enough staff, enough nurses, enough supplies, enough equipment. And that does not fit in with the insurance company's efficiency that they have planned for us. You know, and so the, the system that I would look forward to is a system where I can give the best care to every single person that needs it, exactly what that person needs. I was at my high school reunion and a friend of mine from high school um, has moved out of the country and she lives in Germany now. Mm -hmm. And she was um, actually talking about how that's one of the biggest differences that she notices is that when she needs to get care, she can just go and give you know her Ooh. ID card and just get any care that she needs. And she doesn't have to worry about co-pays or premiums or networks or any of that. She can just go and get what she needs. Um, and that was really powerful. We had a, a Canadian nurse come to our union convention a few years ago and we were trying to explain to her how the American healthcare system worked <laughs> and she could not grasp that fact that you couldn't just present yourself and get what you needed. So, Mark, you've been um, a part of the healthcare movement for a long time, and can you tell us why was single payer healthcare taken off the table, um, kind of leading up to the ACA? Well, I think the uh, people who crafted healthcare reform tried to craft a change that did not offend these powerful interests at the center of the healthcare system. And they did it in what we in the labor movement call the classic mistake of bargaining against yourself, starting, starting the bargaining process by already conceding the, uh, the boss's uh, program. And you know the problem with that is any shop steward will learn real quick is once you've already conceded, it doesn't mean the other side is happy and you have an agreement. They just figured out that you're really weak and they're going to take more and more. You know, the assessment of those folks who crafted this program was that there was too much power on the other side and to get any change we had to concede to that power and I think that's just a backwards way to organize. This is not the end goal that I wanted. Um, it's not the system that I think any patients need, um, but it is in the best interest of the insurance companies. You know, it's gonna take those 47 odd million uninsured people and transform them into paying customers, which is exactly what the insurance companies wanted and exactly why they got on board. I wanna underscore something that, that both of you have said, which is that um, 
you know, the ACA is a market-based system, and in that system, we interact with it as individual consumers. So what I need is my problem. I have to go out and try to solve that problem by myself, and that's the same for all of the other people, and their individuals and families who have to go and try to figure out that problem. And I don't think that the problem of health is actually um, an individual problem. It's a social problem, and we really need a solution that is universal. I don't see how anyone who, you know, if we care about and we were thinking about communities that suffer from disparities, we're thinking about communities that are underserved, we're thinking about, um, you know, all of the inequities that exist in the system, how would we ever rectify that through a market-based um, approach? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that that's been proven to work, ever. <laughs> I don't think we're going to rectify disparities for low-income people, for people of color, for women, for immigrant communities through a market-based system. I think we're going to have to do that through a universal system. So what does that look like for you, Nijmi, especially in the work that you do? What's it going to take to make healthcare a human right? I think it's going to take a mass movement. Um, and I think we feel um, so emboldened and empowered by the work that Vermont has done, uh, the Vermont Worker Center, and now the statewide campaigns as well in Maryland and in Maine and in other places where there are folks that realize that, you know, I mean, one, health and healthcare are issues that are deeply felt by everyone. Everyone has a healthcare story. It's something that actually unites us across all different kinds of lines because we all have needs and, and bodies and we need to be healthy and we need to be free from sickness and disease. Um, if we're going to take care of our families, if we're going to be able to get education and jobs, we actually need to not be sick. So it's something that everyone feels very, very strongly. And you know, if we can come together on that basis and really claim healthcare as a human right, then we have the ability to make it possible. I mean, Mark you know, referenced a lot of people like to say this whole kind of it's not politically possible, but I think we have to make it possible. Um, and you know, we, there isn't anyone who, who really disagrees. Very few people except those who are profiting off of the system mm -hmm. you know, disagree with the position that we need health care and it has to be a human right. People shouldn't be making profit off of the fact that we get sick. Right now, what's really driving change are these powerful grassroots movements from below that are trying to use uh, some openings in uh, health healthcare policy that the ACA creates, Obamacare creates, to, to drive state health care reforms. And they've, Vermont is further, furthest along the track on that. People have been very inspired by the model, organizing model that Vermont has pioneered in this area. And that we, uh, we want to put the labor movement in touch with those kind of dynamic movements on the ground in other states. And we think if we get some breakthroughs at the state level, then we can come back into Washington, D.C. And, and institute this as a national right. Mm -hmm. Up next, a report from a recent event organized by Put People First. This meeting was sort of our Affordable Care Act 101. First, we wanted to introduce it to people so that people have a very clear, kind of concrete understanding of what's offered in this new health care law. We also wanted to make sure people recognize that there, there is some, there, there's been some improvements to, to, to the health care system through the law, and we wanted people to know how to sign up if they're eligible for it. The other part of it was to show the inadequacy of, of the law and to show that you know, the Affordable Care Act is not universal health care. It does not hold up health care as a human right. And so people are really have a clear idea about what's going on with the law. It's not as scary. Um, I think we have some work to do to try to help people to, to see that we can work together, you know, build people power and actually get health care as a human right. I've really been involved for less than a week. I wanted to know if I was eligible for uh, the Affordable Care Act and if not, what was the penalty? It's a good time to try to do something about this particular issue. I hadn't been aware of the Medicaid uh, gap when the state of Pennsylvania has not extended that coverage. So as it turns out, I'm not even uh, eligible. And that just struck me and I was astounded. And I thought, you know, here I've been thinking, oh, good, I voted for Obama because he was going to fix the health care system. And then he finally got this bill passed. Now I can finally get some health insurance. And then I come to find out, oh, actually, I can't get any. And I said, some people really should do something about that. When you, when you find yourself in that position, you get affronted. And 
sometimes you don't really feel that you have the power to do anything about it, but in an organization that's made of people with similar problems and similar interests, it kind of triggers a process of trying to think of what you might be able to really do about it. You're watching The Spark, stories that change our times. Today we're talking about the fight to make healthcare a human right. So what do you say to the people who say that it's just not possible? It's too huge, it's not possible, we can't afford it. We win when we build a social movement and solving the healthcare problem solves all kinds of other problems. There would be no federal budget deficit at all today if the U.S. spent for healthcare what any other industrialized country spends for, for healthcare. And that, to me, that is just such an amazing statistic. I mean, you can solve the federal budget deficit by making health care a right for everyone in America, or you can solve it by cutting food stamps and closing post offices and withdrawing public services. I mean, this is the choice we have. This is the people's survival. This is our future. In Put People First, we always like to start by talking about our own personal stories because I think, um, again, we get conditioned to accept the reality. And I think the reality is that we're actually in an emergency situation when it comes to health and health care. Um, and as soon as we start to talk about our stories, people start bringing out all kinds of things. One of our members was talking about how his mother, you know, delayed getting an ambulance when she thought she was having a heart attack because she was going to have to pay $400 for the ambulance to come to her house. Right? And that kind of thing happens all the time, but we get used to it. Yeah. And so when we actually start sharing our stories, then it's suddenly a room full of people who all have a life or death story about right. lack of, of care. Um, and that kind of thing really ignites people, right? Um, that, the, that kind of thing is really a spark that helps people see that um, we're not alone, right? That we got to get together around this. And that it's really life or death. You know, I think when we re really recognize that it might not be myself that I'm worried about, but it might be my, my child or it might be my mother. And for those people, we're willing to fight. Watching that, it seems like there are people who get it. But what's it going to take to really make that spark? It's going to take a movement powerful enough to break through that, to transform it into what we need, what patients need, what healthcare providers need. Well, it's the gentleman said in the interview, this is a good time to, to bring people together. Everybody's in motion now around health care. The Affordable Care Act has created certain expectations for the first time. People think, well, maybe I, you know, I should be getting health care. And this is something that we should be doing together. And so I think this is a really, it's a very unique time to continue this, this battle. I've been doing this stuff for a long time now. And uh, the movement has peaks and valleys, and, uh, but this movement is continuing to build momentum even beyond the sort of legislative moment that we just lived through. So uh, I'm very optimistic. Um, you know, there are 67 counties in the state of Pennsylvania, and I don't think that there's one of those counties where someone wouldn't be listening to this right now and think, that's just like me. I've gone through that. I've struggled with this. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing is building um, a way, a method for us to really come together to share our stories and to stay connected um, and to really change what's possible. So I just want to invite people to get involved. There are people in many different parts of the state who are engaging folks around them and in telling their healthcare story, in um, you know, getting involved in groups, um, families, you know, folks, places where you can come together with your kids um, and also your whole family and really, um, you know, talk about what is it that we have to do and really build a plan and a strategy to move forward. So when we were talking about what's it going to take to make healthcare a human right, I want to hear from you, Marty, on the other side, as you say, on the other side of the, the bed rail. What, what's it going to take there? Do we have the capacity to kind of give give the care that we really need? Absolutely. There, once you eliminate the insurance companies and you eliminate advertising, you ed uh, eliminate the you know, bazillion dollar CEO salaries and those profits and everything that goes to shareholders, even just eliminating the paperwork is going to free up just tremendous resources into the system. 
So every year we introduce into Harrisburg legislation for nurse to patient ratios. There's ample evidence, nursing research, that shows over and over again, no matter how you slice the patients, by age, by condition, even by race, by socioeconomic status, if having more nurses keeps people alive. And that's what we need. We need more nurses at the bedside to take care of people. And that's what we want to do. We want to be there. We want to be doing that work. First of all, I just want to reinforce what Marty just said. I think healthcare providers are just such a, so passionate about healthcare justice issues and they've been leading, leading the fight in so many ways. And it's, it's so important to, to put them in contact with people in the community to build this movement because that's the kind of interaction that really creates change. In addition to building a base, we want to work with, with labor, we want to work with faith partners, and we really want to work with all um, different kinds of folks who really, we all share this in common mm -hmm. and we really, really know that we're going to need everybody to make this happen. Mm -hmm. We really want to work with everyone to make it happen. I think nurses can be a really powerful part of your base because we are not, uh, we do not get any reimbursement from the insurance companies. We are paid by the institution, we, uh, so we are independent of that money trail and we are with you. Awesome. Great. So right here we're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching The Spark. Stories That Change Our Times, produced by MMP-TV. Thank you, Nijmi, Mark, and Marty for joining us tonight. Your stories and your experience has been so inspiring, not just to me, but to everyone else who's watching. For more stories about everyday people who are leading the way to winning our human rights, visit us online at thespark.tv. Have you been unemployed or had a job that didn't pay a living wage? You having a hard time paying your rent or your mortgage? Is it hard for your family to get quality childcare? All across Pennsylvania, communities are struggling to make ends meet. From our farmlands, to our small towns, to our big cities, we are all affected by common problems. Are you struggling to pay for health care? Do you know friends and family going through the same thing? Is it okay for people in PA to face these problems? Put People First Pennsylvania is bringing people together across all of our differences to confront these issues and build a better Pennsylvania for all of us. No one is going to do this for us. We have to come together and do this ourselves. We have to take this fight to the Capitol. Put People First is building that force in Pennsylvania. To put people first. Put people first. Put people first in Pennsylvania. To be a part of Put People First PA, visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash putpeoplefirstpa or call 570-483-8813.